today, we're in Romans chapter 12. And while you're flipping over there, just to kind of bring us up to date a little bit, most of the time, the Apostle Paul, when he was writing an epistle here, he was dealing with the position of a believer. What Paul would normally do, he would always address a doctrine of the faith before he addressed the duty of the believer. And the reason why Paul did that was Paul wanted each believer to know who they were in Christ. You remember those first eight chapters that we talked about with the Apostle Paul? Everything in those first eight chapters showed man of their awareness of who they really were. They were sinners. We said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each man is a sinner. It's not something that we, had, that we just got once we were born. We were born in the sin. We talked about how the people there, they were starting to venture out into faith and they were worshiping false things. The Apostle Paul kept reaching out to them and telling them, no, 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 you're worshiping the creation. You're supposed to be worshiping the Creator. And Paul then gave them all the doctrines of the faith. And so the first eight chapters, the Apostle Paul talked to them on the doctrines. And then chapters 9, 10, and 11... He dealt with the Jewish believers there. He dealt with them of their past dealings that they had with the Lord. Then he was dealing with them about their present dealings that God had with them as Jews. But then last week, over in chapter 11, we talked about the future dealings that the nation of Israel will have when Jesus returns to earth for the second coming. Now that we've talked about the doctrine... Paul's now getting ready to tell them about the practical application of the faith. Now how the rubber hits the pavement. Now that you know what you're supposed to do, now how do you do it? And that's what we're going to start addressing now in chapters 12, right on through to the end of the book. You know, it's sad to say that most churches do not teach that way. They don't teach a person what they're supposed to know, who they are in Christ, before they're told what to do. Oftentimes, they say, we want you to do this, we want you to do that. But then what happens is a person then goes out and they start doing it. And they say, you know what? I can't live up to this. <laughs> you tell me that I'm supposed to do this. You tell me I'm not supposed to do that. Next thing you know, as a result, they have a legalistic war that's taking place within that person. How can I do this? How can I do that? I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not good enough to do that. I don't have the qualifications that you tell me that I'm supposed to be helping out in this area. But then the Apostle Paul says, once you really truly learn the doctrine, who you are in Christ, that when you accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior, that gave you the right, that gave you the entitlement to do what you're called to do as a believer. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. That's who it's about. It's not about you. Then once that person truly understands that, once they say, you know what, I realize that there's nothing that I can do. He did everything. He died for me on the cross. There's nothing that I can do to get closer to him. There's nothing I could do to earn his favor more. There's nothing I could do to be better. There's nothing I could do to make him shine his light on me more. He has done everything for me that I need to do. All I need to do now is live a life of obedience. He had done nothing else. I can't work for my salvation. I can't work for this. I can't work for that. It was all taken care of on the cross. Then once you and I fully understand that, then we say, you know what? Now that I realize that it's not about me, that it's about Him, He's the one that took care of everything there on Calvary, then I will want to start serving the Lord. But you know what? You're going to start serving the Lord out of gratitude for what He did for you and not because of what you feel you have to do because the church is putting some legalistic term on you. You know, I shared with you that we have a friend of ours. Just to give you an example, they're not allowed to wear pants to their church. When she gets off work on Wednesday nights, and this is right down the street from here, when she gets off work on Wednesday night, she has to go home and take her slacks off and put on a dress to go to church. Do you know what? Most churches wouldn't allow you in their dress like you are today with a pair of shorts on, a pair of flip-flops, and t-shirt. 
But we know that the Lord isn't concerned so much on how we dress or how we look. He's more interested in you coming here, you hearing what He has to say for you, and speak to your hearts. Because we know, we talked about last week, whatsoever is in a man's heart, that he shall become. In other words, we work from the inside out and not the outside in. It's by faith that you are saved, through grace. Not by any good works, we know that. So you see the point I'm getting across. Now the Apostle Paul says, now that you know who you are, now that you know that he did everything, now that you know that you can't work to receive any more favor, now this is what I want you to do. This is the way that we say, thank you, God. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for sending your son to take my place there on the cross. He took my sins and placed them on himself. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. It's unmerited favor, that it was by your grace. And we said that acrostic of grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what you received. That's what I received by Him being there on the cross. Once you and I understand that, we will find our saying, far out. <laughs> cool, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. In light of what you did for me, I want to serve you. I want to do what you saved me to do. So now Paul, after spending 11 chapters of talking about man's ruined condition, then he also talked about God's salvation of that man. Now we're going to see in chapter 12 where Paul's going to begin to encourage us to start serving him. Therefore, in the light of God's mercy, in the light of all that he's done for us, Paul's getting ready to say, now, here's your part. You see everything that he did, but now is your part. Now's the time that you've got to devote your lives to him. Commit your lives unto the Lord. Dedicate yourselves to him. Look at chapter 12, Romans 12, verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, that you present your bodies. <laughs> Here we see <laughs> that... Whenever we come to the Word here in the Bible, and we see that word, therefore, stop and ask yourself, why is that word there, therefore? Paul saying, in light of these 11 chapters, in light of these previous 315 verses that you've been through up to this particular point, in light of who you are in Christ and who you enjoy because of Christ, he says, I beseech you. Now, if you have another version, it may say, I urge you. I urge you. Some translations say, I beg you. I beg you, Paul's saying. In light of everything that you've been taught, here's, I'm, I'm begging you. This is something that you've got to do. Now, what was Paul begging these people to do? Look at the second part of that in verse 1. It says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Which is your reasonable service. He's saying, Paul's saying, I'm begging you. I'm begging you, brothers and sisters, give yourself completely. Give yourself completely over to the Lord. How do we do that? He's saying here, by presenting your body. Presenting your body to God. You know, it's really important, the, the importance of the human body, and the reason I say that, it can't be overstated, because when you think of it, the one thing that's here on earth that's been abused probably more than anything else is your body. My body's been beat to death. Between my drinking, between my partying years, between working 12, 14 hour days, between all the things that people do. Some people eat too much, some people become in inactive, some people become too active, some people take drugs, some people take alcohol. There's many, many different ways that we abuse our body. Paul's saying here, I want you to present your bodies. So as we see, God's not only interested in a person's spirit, but he's also interested in your body as well as your spirit. He says, to, he says hey, believer, here's what I want you to do. I want you to present your body as a living sacrifice. The believer's offering of his body is to be sacrificial. Now remember, 
we're studying this in the book of Leviticus, and we just got through with the book of Exodus, how in the Old Testament that a person would take an animal and they would offer it to God as their substitute, as their place. They would take that animal and they would offer it to God as a sacrifice. Now Paul's saying, now I want you to take your body, present it to the Lord as a sacrifice. But notice what he's calling it here, a living sacrifice. He's not telling them, kill your body. Or kill the person next to you and offer it. He says, no, offer your body as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice means several different things. One of the ways a living sacrifice means a constant, continuous sacrifice, not just an occasional dedication. A living sacrifice. It's a continuance. You're constantly saying, Lord, Forgive me what I've done. <laughs> you know what I did today. You know how I acted. You know how I treated that bank clerk. You know how I looked at something wrong that I shouldn't have looked at on TV. You know how I checked the girl out at the supermarket. You know. I know, Lord, that I apologized yesterday, but I'm coming to you again today, Lord, and I'm saying, please forgive me what I've done. That's what a living sacrifice is. A continuous sacrifice offering of yourself over and over again. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. Please forgive me of it. It means that you want to keep living for the Lord. You don't just, like, once, we don't get up just one time in the morning and eat, then not eat the rest of the day. We don't just go to the gas station one time and get gas and never worry about getting gas again. It's a continuous thing. It's the same way with our walk with the Lord. When you know that you've made a mistake, confess it. Get rid of it. Confess it to the Lord right then on that spot. That's what it means. Living sacrifice. Another thing that it means, a living sacrifice means that the body sacrifices its own desires. Sacrifices its own desires. I remember when I tried to quit smoking. That was the hardest thing in the world for me to do, was to try to quit smoking. People say, won't you just quit? And I said, man, my body just keeps craving it. <laughs> you know, my mind craves it. My body craves it. Everything. And the guy that was discipling me at that time, I was a young Christian. He was a retired airline pilot. And he had a bunch of information. I used to meet with him every Monday in a park. And he used to bring me all the literature that they would give to the airline pilots. And they would say, if you're getting ready to quit smoking or attempt to quit smoking, here's what we want you to do. We want you to tell somebody else that works on the plane with you. We also want you to tell your supervisor, also tell the co-pilot with you. Here's the reason why. You say you want to quit smoking, but after about an hour or two hours, depending upon how heavy of a smoker you were, your body starts craving it, starts having that desire for it. You end up, if you're not a strong person, you end up giving in to it. When you give in to it, what does that do to you mentally? Makes you feel like a failure. Now, do you want the pilot of the airplane to all of a sudden start feeling like a failure? He's not worth anything. He's no good. Do you want that guy to think that? No, not at all. I don't want him to think that. I'd probably be out there with a cigarette giving it to him. <laughs> Just joking. But you get the point I'm getting across. They told you to tell somebody, and they said, your body is going to crave it. And they had the most interesting survey. And, this, and I'll never forget this. This is what helped me quit smoking. One of the things was inside that it says, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day? I smoked two to three packs a day at that time. I had all my life. They said the average cigarette, that the average smoker would take about 10 hits off of that one cigarette. If I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, that's 40 cigarettes. 40 cigarettes times 10 hits off each one, that's 400 hits a day you're throwing into your body. What other drug do you hit 400 times in your body in one day? So I remember when I says, I've had enough. I'm not going to do this anymore. And I remember laying in bed one night. And I remember waking up about 2 o'clock in the morning. And my bed was like you had just taken a garden hose 
and sprayed my bed down. My bed was soaking wet. I woke up. I had cramps all over me. I thought I was dying. My head was pounding. I, I just, if I could have gotten up and drove myself to the emergency room, I would have went. But I couldn't get out of bed to do it. I laid there all night in pain. Next morning, I had to go into work, and one of the ladies says, man, you look rough. Did you tie one on last night? I said, no. I says, I don't know what happened to me. She looked right at me, and she says, do you want me to tell you what it is? I says, what? She says, your body was craving the nicotine. You'd been about 21 days and hadn't had a cigarette, and your body had the craving for it. Later that morning, I was cutting a doctor's hair, and I got to tell him about it, and he said, cravings. Your body was craving. He says, all the nicotine that you pumped in your body, do you think you're just going to get rid of it and not have a desire for it? As a living sacrifice, your body is going to have to learn to deny the desires that it has. That may be eating. That may be different things. And some of you are saying, now you're meddling now. <laughs> now you're talking about food. Now you're going to meddling in my business now. <laughs> Yeah, and the third thing is a living sacrifice mean that, means that the body lives for God. And the way that a body lives for God is by serving God. By reaching out, meeting the needs of other people. That may mean in your home, in your workplace, at the airport, at a bus station, in a restaurant, in a grocery store, wherever you are, use your body as a living sacrifice. Now, you say, well, how do I do that? By being there and by letting the mouth be the vocal piece. But your body's the one that got you there in order to use your mouth. He's saying right through here, let your living body, use it as a sacrifice unto the Lord. Let that be one act of worship. The way that you worship is by your body, by you communicating with people, by you going to the places so you could share the gospel. We said last week in Romans, how beautiful are the feet. And we said, some of us ain't got real beautiful feet. But the Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That's the way you, you're living sacrifices. By your body getting you somewhere where you can preach the good news, that's an act of worship that we do unto the Lord. Now you say, well, why? <laughs> why do I need to do all this? Why do I need to let my body be a living sacrifice? <laughs> Because of what he did for you. Because of what he did for you. <laughs> Paul says here, truly, truly it's reasonable. It's a reasonable service to give yourself to the Lord. You say, Lord, I'm laying down my life for you. In light of everything that you did for me, in light of who I was, you still love me. <laughs> in light of who I was, when nobody else thought there was any hope in me, You've seen something in me that nobody else seen. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing for that. I want to now lay down my life for you because you gave yourself for me. You've seen great things. You had great things in store for me. I don't want to miss any of the things that you got in store for me. That's why when we talked in here the other day about spiritual gifts, and I said some areas, some things we may teach just a little bit different. We believe that the gifts can be for today. We believe that God still heals people today. We still believe that God still speaks to people today. And sometimes we just have to say, Lord, I don't fully understand it. I've never spoken a tongue in my life, Lord. But if that's a gift that you want me to have, I just want to be open to receive. I don't want to deny nothing that you've got for me. Whatever you have in store for me, I'm laying down my life. I'm going to try to live a clean, pure life. I'm going to open up myself to receive whatever you have to offer me. I don't know about you, but I don't want to turn down nothing that the Lord has for me. I want everything that he has for me. You know what? When we say this and then we follow through with it, I believe that's well-pleasing unto the Lord. When we follow through with it. It's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to do it. <laughs> Just like the Apostle Paul says, now that you know the doctrine, now that you know why God saved you and these first 11 chapters, now that you fully understood that you were wretched, you were no good, you were a sinful person, but God saved you. Now that you know all that, now that you know that you're born again, now that you know you can have victory in life, now that you know that you're going to go be with God eternally in heaven, now that you know all this, Here's what I need for you to do. <laughs> Commit your life to him. Commit your life to him. Look at the second 
chapter 12, verse 2, the first part. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <laughs> every one of us, every one of us in here today, you're in one of two categories. You're either a conformer <laughs> or you're either a transformer. You're one of the two. Right now, there's people trying to figure out, where did that person buy that dress? Where did that person, that's a nice looking car. How can they afford that car? How can they afford that big home that they're doing? How can I kind of fit in like maybe the way that they're fitting in? You're either thinking that way or you're thinking like an evangelist named J.B. Phillips. He says, you know what? I don't care what the world is doing. I'm not going to let me squeeze this into its mold. Either you're trying to conform to the world's ways or you're on the other side of the fence and you're saying, I don't care what the world does. I'm not going to let it squeeze me into its mold. I'm not going to do that. I refuse to do it. Paul's saying here to the believers, don't fashion yourself. Don't fashion your life and your conduct by those around you. That could even be to the people in the church, too. Be careful who you fashion yourself after. I remember when I first got saved and I got plugged into a church and I thought certain people were real spiritual, religious. And I remember my apostle Paul, the guy that was discipling me, the fellow I was telling you about, airline pilot. I remember him saying to me when I, would, I was still in that worldly way where I'd look at somebody and think, wow, they're pretty cool, they're pretty hip, this and that. They come out of the same background I did. And he would say, Bill, get to know somebody. Get to know who they are in the Lord before you want to be like that person. Because oftentimes things are not what they seem. <laughs> so be careful. Don't put your eyes just on everybody. We're believers. We're human. Don't put your eyes on me. At some point, I'll let you down. If you hang out with me for a couple days, at some time you'll say, you know what? I can't believe you said that. <laughs> I can't believe you did that. <laughs> We're human. We're human. So many people look at the people in the church, then the one minute that they look at somebody and they get mad, they quit coming to church. Don't come to church for the people. Come to church to hear the Word of God and not just to see or be seen or whatever. Judith and I just talked about this in the last couple of days about how somebody quit going to church that we knew because somebody had done them wrong. And I said, shame, shame, that shows me their immaturity in the faith. When you get offended at somebody, don't quit coming to church. Whether it's me or whether it's somebody else. If you got a problem, take it up with the person. If I ever do something or say something that, that you feel offended by, come tell me. Let's talk about it. If I'm wrong, I'll share with you. I'll say, I'm sorry, I apologize. If I have to, I'll get up here and repent before the whole church if I'm wrong. But if you're wrong, I'm going to stand firm on what God's Word has to say about it. That's the bottom line. So Paul's saying right through here, <laughs> don't fashion yourself. Don't fashion your conduct or your life by other people that are around you. You're either a thermometer <laughs> where you adjust into the temperature of the culture, or you're either a thermostat. <laughs> you're changing the climate of the culture. If you're a conformer or a thermometer, same thing, you're in for a real frustration. <laughs> because by the time you take the temperature of what's going on around you, by the time you try to figure out of what this person's doing, what that person's doing, what the world's doing, if you're like me and you're trying to some ways conform to the things of the world, by the time I get it figured it out, the world's already passed by and I'm still stuck way back here in the back. One way is computers. <laughs> I'm not saying in that particular way. We need those. we got to have them every day just to work anymore. I do all my messages on a laptop. But the thing is, is people. When you look at people and see who they are in their worldly walk, and you try to be like them, and you try to figure out ways to be like them, Paul's saying, don't do it. If you're trying to be like that person, you got a lot of frustration lying ahead of you. Don't be a thermometer. Don't just adjust your life to everybody else's around you, it's not going to work. 
It's going to leave you in a place where you don't want to be. The Apostle Paul is telling us that. It's interesting because the world itself would tell us, you've got to do this and you'll be happy. If you have that, you will be happy. They're telling us all these different things that we got to do or we got to buy or we got to make happy, whatever. You can buy a brand new Harley Davidson. You get out there and you shine it every single day. I know I've been there. But six months later, now it's down to once a month. Then a couple years later, it's down to just when you can't see it anymore. You got to wash it. Things wear out. The Apostle Paul saying, don't put your faith, don't put your hope in the things of the world because you'll let down. You'll get let down every single time. Don't adjust to everything that's taken on around you. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here's why. These are three ways that he's talking about. Every sin falls into one of these three categories. And he says, if you fall into it, if you conform to it, you're not of the Father. Here's one of them. He says, For everything in the world, the craving of sinful men, things that you crave, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has or what he does. He's saying right through here, be careful. <laughs> You're going to let your eyes get to you. You're going to set your mind on things. But then also that last one is a pride issue. It's a pride issue. Be careful, he's saying. Because when you get into that, it says, let me read that last verse. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but it comes from from the world. Then it goes on to say, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Hmm. So, what's the key? Don't be a thermometer. <laughs> Don't start conforming. Don't start adjusting your life to everything that's going on around you. Say, I'm a whole lot different <laughs> than you are, world. I'm living for eternity. <laughs> I'm not living for just to be happy right now. You know, once we truly, fully get that concept in our mind that you're born again, if you are. If you're born again and you're on your way to heaven, you're just supposed to enjoy the ride right now. Jesus says, I come so you may have life, but you may have that life abundantly. He wants us to enjoy where we're at right now. Once we truly understand who we are in Christ, things should not affect us the way that they affected us before we became a Christian. By no means whatsoever. People ask me, aren't you afraid of getting in a wreck on your motorcycle? No, I'm cautious, but I'm not concerned about it. <laughs> if I get killed, I'm going to be with the Lord. Now, does that mean I want to go home right now? No, I still got work to do here, but you know what? That's not a major concern of mine no more. When I get on my bike, I pray before I get on it. When I throw my leg across the seat, I pray. Lord, put your protection around me. Send your angels wrapping around my bike. Send them ahead of me. And Lord, let me have a good time today. <laughs> and I go on. So I'm not going to worry about those things. You know, it's kind of interesting because the word transformed in its true form is a word for metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Interesting, in the, in the Bible, it's used two other different times in the New Testament. One time was when the mountain of transfiguration, when Jesus was before the brothers there. What did he do? It says he shined. He glowed. before. There was a change that took place. There was a transformation that took place within him. They're on the Mount of transfiguration. The other one talks about it in Hebrews of what happens to a person when they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, when they become a believer, there's a change that takes place in you. If you don't see a change in your life since you accepted Christ and your old life, there's been no transformation. The heart and the mind and your actions, they have to be on the same page. <laughs> it can't be one. You've heard the expression, there's 18 inches between heaven and hell. Having it here, but not having it here. It's just about 18 inches. You can have it in the head, but if you don't have it in the heart, it'll do you no good whatsoever. Then you're just intellectually smart. <laughs> but you're not saved. You're not born again. 
So those are two different times that there was that metamorphosis that took place inside the New Testament. How were we transformed? How were we metamorphosed? Let me read verse 2 again. <laughs> and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you must prove, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <laughs> Just as Jesus was metamorphosed, you too can change. But here's the thing. You have to keep your mind on Him. In order for you to be a transformation to take place in your life, you have to keep your mind on the Lord. How do we keep our minds on Him all the time? By keeping in the Word. Psalm 47 and Hebrews 10, 7, it says, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. Jesus says that. Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. You see, giving our bodies as a living sacrifice is a real key. But it's incomplete. It's incomplete <laughs> unless I keep my mind on Him. If I give my body and don't keep my mind on Him, what happens? I'll end up going right back out to the world. I'll end up start thinking things I used to think. I'll start doing things I used to do. I'll catch my place going places that I used to go. But then when I stay as a living sacrifice, and every time I say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me get back into your word, then all of a sudden, whenever I do that, then all of a sudden I'm right back in line to where I should be. Behold, I'm in the volume of the book, he says. But I want to share something with you. <laughs> You can read your Bible every morning. You can spend time in devotions. You can come here every Sunday and do verse by verse out of the New Testament. You can come every Thursday night and you can spend time with us doing verse by verse out of the Old Testament. You can know the word backwards. You can know the word forwards. And not go through a metamorphosis. Not go through a transformation. You can know it. You can walk forwards and backwards and not happen. If you read the scriptures and you're just looking at it like to get insight, if you're just saying, well, you know, I'd like to know a little bit about parenting or maybe I'd like to know a little bit more about relationships. When you're going just for that reason, there won't be a change to take place. You say, why? Because transformation only occurs when you study the Word and when you're studying the Word, you're trying to reach out and touch the Lord. <laughs> you're trying to reach out and you're saying, you know what? <laughs> I want you to guide my life. I want you to teach me what you have to say. I want you to reveal yourself to me in all this. I don't want to know just about relationships. What do you have to say about relationships? Lord, teach me what I'm supposed to know in this situation. And you're seeking Him to give you directions, and you're not just looking for wisdom, but you're looking for it from the Creator. He touches you. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. Then the Word became flesh. He became personable. <laughs> With His disciples, He became personable. He became touchable. He became relatable. That's when the Lord would touch you. That's when the Lord would transform you. When you get into that personal relationship with Him. Not just show me, but tell me. Show me and tell me. What would your will be done in what I'm going through? Speak to me. Speak to me. Show me exactly what you want me to do. If you approach the Word strictly from some intellectual, some academic way, some theological perspective... Oh, you might gain a point or two. But you'll not be changed. It only comes from that direct touch of the Lord. And the only way that you're going to get that direct touch of the Lord is by offering your body as a sacrifice and by keeping your mind set on Him. Not by out doing your own thing. But it comes to that point, just like when we talked a couple of weeks ago about the prodigal son. When did that change take place in him? 
when he says, I've sinned against you, God, and I've sinned against my Father. When he realized that what he was doing, leading him down the wrong path, and he realized that he had sinned against God, when he realized that he sinned against man, then things got right in his life. But it was when he reached out to the Lord first. Notice it doesn't say he reached out to his daddy first. No, he reached out to the Lord first and says, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against my father, and I want to make things right. Then all of a sudden it says that when he went back, how did his father stand there? Open arms. Come on home, son. That's just what the Lord does with you and I. When we come to him, we say, you know what? <laughs> I know it's important for me to know this. I know it's important for me to to be able to know where to go when somebody asks me something and i got to look it up. I know it's important for that, but it's even more important for you to show me, for you to tell me, for me to know you in a personal relationship, not just by some doctrine, <laughs> but in an applicable way, a way, Lord, that only you can teach me. Then, when that happens... When you speak to the Lord and you hear the Lord speak to you, then that metamorphosis that we talked about, most of you know, that's what takes place with the butterfly. And when we turn around and when we get into that relationship with the Lord and we truly seek Him and we tell Him we love Him, show me what you want, then all of a sudden you'll start soaring like a butterfly. You'll have all that pain relieved from me. You'll have all that stuff released from me. And then all of a sudden, then you'll be able to walk in an upright way with the Lord. You'll have joy. You'll have happiness that you haven't had before. But it only takes place, place when that change takes place, when there's a transformation within a person. You know, I would have to say that just, I know when I'm at pastor's conferences, and I know just by me talking to people, probably one of the most, uh, more often asked questions than any other question that a pastor has ever asked, how do I find God's will in my life? If you think that's not, the most question asked, look at what is on the top bestsellers list. What was the name of Rick Warren's book? Purpose Driven Life. What was the name of Joel Osteen's book, Living Your Best Life Now? These are all books, and there's many, many other authors that jumped on the bandwagon. They all wrote books about how to find God's will in your life. What was interesting about these books is not only are they number one in the Christian market, but they're number one in the secular market. Only because it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. Everybody wants to know what their will is, or what God's will for their life. Why was I created? What's my purpose for being here? I remember asking that myself for years. <laughs> There's got to be more to life than this. How do I find God's will in my life? It's funny because a lot of times when people ask that, it's based on this presumption or this idea that God's will is hidden for their life or God's will is lost and it needs to be found. It shouldn't be that hard to discern. Those of you that are asking what God's will for your life is, it's right in these two texts that we just talked about right through here. Paul tells you what to do to discover God's plan for your life. It's simple. <laughs> it's profound when you understand it. That word there, prove, like in verse 2, down there it says, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's funny because that word prove, it doesn't mean for academics, but it means of intimacy. Now, the reason I say that is because when you look over in Genesis 4.1, where Scripture records, records Adam knew Eve. That means that he knew her intimately. I'm not talking about sexually, but I'm talking about intimately. He knew her. This is what Paul's declaring to us. You can know God in an intimate way. <laughs> you can know it not only intellectually by knowing the Scriptures, knowing who He is, knowing what He did and everything, but you can know Him personally. But first of all, Paul's saying, if you want to know God in that type of a way, there's a couple of things that you've got to do. Look at verse 1 again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. <laughs> but you're probably saying, uh-oh, that disqualifies me. My body's anything but holy. Therefore, how can it be acceptable if it's not holy? 
That's when a lot of people then start to get discouraged. I know I did. When I first read this for the first time, and I was a new Christian, even somebody that's been in the faith for a while, you think, how can I offer my body as something holy, something pleasing? How can I offer that? <laughs> and then we have a tendency to say, until my body is holy and my body is acceptable, I can't offer it as a living sacrifice. But that's because they failed to read the most important word that's inside that verse there. He says, I beseech you, I urge you, therefore, brethren. In this case, therefore, that word therefore is in reference to the first 11 chapters. He says, even though you know everything, therefore, now that you know who you are in Christ, now that you know in the light of how you lived and what Christ did for you, now that you know all these things, now that you know that when you accepted Him, God placed you in His family through His Son, Jesus, now that you know that, guess what? <laughs> you were made holy. You can never be holy on your own. But when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were made holy. You were made pleasing unto the Lord. Now that you were made that way, therefore, the first step of finding God's will in your life is to present your body as a living sacrifice. Now, in another way, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? It means, Lord, I'm yours. I love you more than anything else that I'm going to pursue. The problem, however, with the living sacrifice is that it's unlike a dead sacrifice. Remember when in the Old Testament we talked about when the guy that was delivering his sin from himself over into the animal, it said that if he brought a bull, he would bring the bull up front, lay his head on the bull, press in lightly. That would transfer. It gave us the idea of him transferring his sin over into that bull. And then all of a sudden he would reach down and take the knife and slit the bull's throat himself. Then the bull, blood would start bleeding out. Then the bull would drop down on his knees. And we said that when that bull was falling down, that person that had transferred that, his sin over in that animal, he had to have compassion. To know that that animal's blood was being sacrificed when it should have been his. Should have been him getting his throat split. That's how important it is. <laughs> but yet... We're different than that. Paul's saying now that we're in the New Testament, you're to offer your body as a living sacrifice. You're going to keep making mistakes, but I want you to keep offering it. Not like that other sacrifice in the Old Testament where it could only be one time. But you are a living. That's what living sacrifice means, a continuous thing that you need to do. How many times do we go up to the altar and we say, you know what, Lord? Or we sit here and we pray, and we say, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did, forgive me. <laughs> and then we turn around and we get up and we go right back out and do it again. <laughs> you say, boy, did I squirm off of that altar pretty quick. <laughs> I made mistakes real, real quick. When that happens, then you just continuously come back to the altar. You say, you know what, Lord, <laughs> I made that mistake yesterday. And I went right back out and I did it again. I know, Lord, that I told you if you help me through that I was going to quit. I know, Lord, that I let you down because I left here and it wasn't even two hours before I went back out and did it again. The Lord says, just come back. Confess it to me. Just tell me that. Do you think the Lord had rather for us to come back and say, I'm sorry for what I did three days in a row? Or do you think the Lord, after the first day, just says, I don't want to hear it no more. Get away. You go live your own life. <laughs> I'm not going to deal with you. We don't serve a God like that. We serve a God of grace. We serve a God who knows we're going to make mistakes. When you became a Christian, that did not make you perfect. Paul knows that. He says, I know that you're going to be dealing with the same old things. He says, why do I do the things I don't want to do? And how come I don't do the things I want to do? Oh, wretched man that I am, he says. Remember we said that Paul says that us believers were kind of schizos a little bit. Because we say we want to do something, but then we don't do it. And we don't do things that we say we're going to do. The Apostle Paul says, oh, you get so believers. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. He's saying right through here, you know what? You're going to keep making mistakes, but you're a uh, living sacrifice. When you make a mistake, climb right back up on the altar again. Come right back up. 
He says, but guess what? When you climb back up and you confess it, if you confess your sins, he is just and faithful to forgive you of your sins. And then here's the neat part. I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When you ask for forgiveness, he says that he forgives you. But the neat part about this, he says, I remember no more. Your sins are forgiven. They're as far as the east is from the west. He says, I remember no more. But it's us who keep bringing it up to ourselves. That's the devil doing that to you. That's not of the Lord to keep bringing that back up on you. That's our adversary. <laughs> That's the one who keeps talking to you. Paul says, you know what? You just come right on up. You're a living sacrifice. You climb back up on the altar. You say, Lord, <laughs> I'm tired of trying to figure out where I should go, what I should do. I keep messing up time and time again. I've tried to go my own way. Things didn't work out. It keeps bringing distance in between me and you. I give up, Lord. Take my life. Take my life. I want to live for you. <laughs> that is the first experience to God's will. <laughs> is to say, I'm giving myself to you. I'm giving myself. I'm offering myself to you. Then in Romans 12, too, right through there, it's kind of neat because he says, don't be conformed in this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that is uh, what is that good and it's that one perfect will of God. <laughs> be transformed, he's saying right through there. The word transform, we said it's metamorpho, from which we get the word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis also appears in Matthew 17. We said that's where it was used to describe the change at the Mount of Transfiguration. That's when Jesus was transformed. That's when he spoke, uh, spoke to Moses and Elijah about death. When he spoke about laying down his life sacrificiously. How do you become transformed? Become a living sacrifice to the Lord and then keep your mind on the Lord. Don't be conformed to the world's thinking, to the world's way, Paul's saying. Instead, give your mind to God and you will know His good acceptance and perfect will. When you give these things to the Lord, that sounds good, you say, but how does that work for me practically? How do I do it? I mean, I hear you up front saying it, but how do I really take and do that to my life? When the disciples were wondering what Jesus was going to do and what was going to go on, what was coming next. Here's a guy that had been with them for three years. They've seen him heal people. They've seen him raise people. They've seen him provide food for thousands of people. They've seen him do all these miracles. Now they're wondering what's going on. He tells us that he's going to be leaving us. How can he leave us and leave us out here on our own? Jesus looked right at him and he said, Let your hearts not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may also be. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Then all of a sudden Thomas cried out. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And I like Jesus. He looked at these confused and these distressed disciples that have been hanging out with him. And on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus said to him, I am the way. You know the way. It's me. <laughs> In 14.6, John 14.6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. What Jesus, uh, what Jesus was basically saying to these guys, it's not information that I'm giving you, <laughs> but it's who I'll be for you. It's who I'll be for you. He took your place. He took my place. <laughs> when you and I let Jesus be the way, let him be our way. Colossians 3.15 says that his peace will rule your hearts. It's kind of interesting because that word rule in the Greek it speaks of a sports official. So Christ his peace will act as an umpire in your heart calling every thought or action that you do safe or out. How many times have you went to do something and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says don't do this. <laughs> you know you ought not to be doing that. Yes, it's okay for you to go ahead and do this. How many times have we had that happen to us? Happened to me all the time. <laughs> Feel good about it. That's the Holy Spirit inside of you being the umpire. 
trying to guide your life and direct it the right way. But not only that, but His will will be written in your heart or on your heart. Jeremiah 31, 33. It will be written on your heart. That's powerful. No longer will you struggle or wonder what you should do with His will now that it's imprinted on your heart. You can follow your hearts. You can follow your desire. You can know that it is God's will for you to do something by the Holy Spirit making confirmation with you that, yes, it's okay to do that. Just like when we started to come into this building, my flesh side said, Lord, you know, we only got so much money. (laughs) But then we get in the building, we're probably going to be out of money. Then we're going to be worried about paying next month's rent. (laughs) Then all of a sudden, I told Judith and and some of y'all, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and he says, go for it. It's okay, go for it. It's not about you anyway. (laughs) It's about me. If it's meant to be, I'll provide for it. You're not providing, and the people in the church aren't even providing. I'm providing them with the jobs. I'm providing them with the tithes. I'm providing them with everything that they got anyway. So it's not about the people in your church. It's about me. That's what the Lord says. I felt the confirmation from the Holy Spirit speaking, go for it. That's what he does. He's that umpire in your heart saying, do this, don't do that. And he's not doing it out of legalistic ways. He's doing it to guide you, (laughs) to guide you in his walk for your life. Psalms 37, 4 says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. To delight thyself in the Lord, it means to have a good time with him. (laughs) Have a good time with him. Enjoy the Lord. Enjoy who he is. Enjoy what he did for you. Give your body to him. Keep your mind on him. Climb on his shoulders and say, Lord, (laughs) you know what? I know you got something planned for me. I don't know exactly what to do because, Lord, you did not give me a direct route for me to go by. I have to step out in faith. But I know as long as I keep my mind on you, even though you didn't give me a direct route, I know that you're with me as I go through this route. This here is my road map. This here is my map that teaches me how when I get off track, it lets me know. But the good part about it is when it gets off, when I get off track, this right here shows me how to get back on track. So I go back the right way. This is our road map to living a life that God saved us for. Suddenly you have desires in your heart that would constitute what his will for your life is. You will. You'll start thinking about things. People say, how did you know that you were supposed to go to North Carolina? And I said, well, I just felt like the Lord placed it in our heart. And they said, well, how do you know that? I said, because <clears throat> we used to talk about it at night. Every night when Judith and I would go to bed, we'd lay there and talk about it. And this thing I know, we started talking about it first thing in the morning when we got up. And this thing I know, we caught each other calling each other throughout the day and talking about it. The Lord placed it on our heart. That this was the desire because we constantly, that's got what we thought about. That's what we talked about. And we thought, Lord, if this is your will, reveal it to us. And it's like he was saying, well, how much more do I have to do? (laughs) You know, I put it on your mind 24 hours a day. I'm opening up doors for you to do things. What more do you actually need to know? (laughs) We just need to be simple enough to believe that if we just delight ourselves in him, he would change My desires, here's the key. When you and I learn who He is and what He did for us, that He would take my desires, my desires, and they would conform them to His will. A lot of times people, I just talked to a guy the other day that is a fabulous guitar player. And he says, you know, Bill, he says, when I got saved, I quit playing for about six years. He says, every time I picked up my guitar, I got flashbacks of what I was like before I got saved. I laid down the guitar. He says, but now that I'm saved, the Lord's put it in my heart to lead a worship group. He took what I enjoyed doing the most in life, and when I gave up on it, he took those desires that I love to do, but now you know what he did? Now he took my gifts, and here I am using them to worship him. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome how God does that for us. (laughs) In the book 
of Psalm 37, the first words in the first, first seven verses kind of go, do not fret for trust and delight and commit and rest. Isn't that pretty powerful? Do not fret for trust, delight, and commit and rest in Him. It's pretty powerful. Notice that word, though. That one word caught me. Commit. Commit. That is the key word. Commit there. Commitment is desperately needed among believers. <laughs> the Bible urges us in the two strongest terms to present ourselves to the Lord with complete devotion. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, was a tremendous example of this, and I'm getting ready to finish it up. In the late 18th and 19th centuries, the Methodist movement became an ep epidemic in England and North America, tipping from 20,000 followers to 90,000 followers just in the U.S. From 20,000 to 90,000 people in a space of about five or six years in the 1780s. That's quite a growing pattern. <laughs> From 20,000 to 90,000 in less than five years. And it's kind of interesting because this founder, John Wesley, was by no means a charismatic preacher. He was by no means a great theologian, such as other people of his time, such as John uh, Calvin, or also such as that Martin Luther. Both of them were about the same time. He did not have the charisma that these other guys had. But what's the key? <laughs> Why did his church grow so much? Because he did more than just preach. What he did was he also traveled, and when he went and spoke, he stayed there for a little while. He stayed long enough in each town to form an enthusiastic group of converts. So every time he went somewhere, he preached. When people come forward and they got saved, he didn't leave them. He stayed with them. Then he would take those group of peoples, he would teach them the Bible. He would turn them into like little religious societies, little groups in each area that he went. As those groups grew in the Word, then they would take and break down into smaller groups of about 10 or 12 people. So if he had one group that came in and say it had 35, 36 people, and they were all being filled up with the Word, then he would take and say, here's what I want you to do. Take those people, those 36, and divide them into three groups of 12. Let them have that personal fellowship time with each other. Let them have that time of sitting down and breaking bread together. Let them have that time of studying the Bible together. Let them have time. That's where Calvary Chapel gets, we work off of Acts 2.42. When I met with uh, uh, my pastor down there, and this is a church of 4,000 now, he says to me when him and I were having lunch, he says, if I can share anything with you, stay with Acts 2.42. When things get big and they get blown out of proportion, and I see 4,000 people sitting here on one weekend, that's people that attend. That's not on attendance record, but that's actual there. He says, when I get overwhelmed with everything, and I, I believe, I can't, wow, we just spent $30,000 in palm trees or this or that or whatever it may be. He says, when I get over." Uh, with my mind where I can't take anymore, I go back to Acts 2.42. What's it all about? Study the Word together, fellowship together, break bread together, and have communion together. In other words, meet together. That's what it's all about. That's what John Wesley did here with the Methodist Church. They kept sticking around. Now, here's the neat thing about it. <laughs> These converts, they were required to attend le uh, weekly meetings and to adhere to a strict code of conduct. If they failed to live up to the standards, they were expelled from the group. Now, you may say that's being legalistic, but he knew that this group had to stand for something. He knew that if you made a commitment to be there to help get something going, your commitment was very important. The Jehovah Witnesses do that today and their churches. If they got people that are coming to church for a while and they quit coming, they go to their house. They say, where are you at? We miss you. They invite them. They say, we'll come get you. We'll do whatever it takes to get you back inside the church. If you're not there for so long, then they will excommunicate you from the church. I don't agree with that, but I'm just saying I do agree with the commitment level that they want their people to have with them. So John Wesley, he succeeded because he understood the great need for a commitment. 
to be so dedicated to God that the temptations of the world were put out of sight and were put out of mind. He knew that there had to be a commitment to offer their bodies as a sacrifice, but he also knew that those people that became a believer, they had to keep their mind on God. He knew that. So today, I'm asking you, <laughs> just sit on the shoulders of the one who said, I'm the way. <laughs> I'm the truth. I'm the life. Just climb up, sit on my shoulders, and enjoy the ride. The only thing that I ask you to do is just cling to me. <laughs> Keep your mind on me. And you'll end up right where you're supposed to be, whether it's vocationally or whether it's relationally. If you just cling to me, he says, you'll be right where you're supposed to be. So first, offer your body as a living sacrifice. And second, keep your mind on me. And when you do that and you attach yourself to me, you'll end up right where you're supposed to be. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are the way. We thank you, Lord, that it's not about us. It's not about who we are, but it's about who we are in you. And Father, I just say, Lord, that if you showed me anything in this last year and a half that we've been up here, if you showed me anything at all, I would have to say that I've learned that it's not about me, but it's about you. And Lord, we know, Father, that once we keep our minds attached to you, once we offer ourselves to you and say, I'm no longer mine, I'm now yours, you're the one that saved me, you're the one that pulled me out of the pit of hell, you're the one that brought me into your kingdom, that now I'm going to offer myself to you as that living sacrifice that, yes, I know I'm going to make a mistake, yes, I know that I'm going to fail, yes, I know that I'm going to let you down, yes, I know that I'm going to do things that are not pleasing you, but I also do know that all I have to do is come back to you and ask you for forgiveness. That doesn't give me a license to go back out and do wrong, but I know that I'm doing it because I want to do it. I know that I'm coming back to you because I want to come back to you. I know, Father, that that then is a part of walking with you. So, Lord, I just want to be attached to you. I want to keep my mind to you. And, Lord, just continue to lead my life in every areas of my life. And Father, we just thank you for this time today that we can sit here and break your word apart and just dissect it and study it. But Lord, we know that it's not just about the word, but it's about you. It's about you. That every time we open this Bible, it's like you taking your mouth and directly open it up and speaking to each one of us. Again, Father, teach us, guide us, and be with us. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we're here today. Amen. And everyone is invited to (coughs) baptism. We have directions up here for those of you that don't know how to get to Rob and Debbie's property. And um, everyone, I guess, is just bringing their own food or something. How how are we doing this so that we know? Just stop and pick up whatever each person wants and bring it out? Is that? Kind of potluck style, I guess. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So if you need to know how to get out there, because they're out Max Patch. So for those of you that don't know where that's at. (laughs) (laughs) Rob, do you want to tell people here uh, basically how to get out there so that...